When our oldest son, Paul, was a little boy, he was adventurous. I think that's the word. <laughs> Always pushing the limits. And I tried many approaches in disciplining him, including the, quote, discussion method. My normal method was just beat. <laughs> but I thought I'd try a different method. Now the discussion method is where you resist blowing your top and using all kinds of physical harm in favor of discussing the problem and finding a solution. You know what I mean, you get down eye to eye with the child and you talk and you have a back and forth. So one day he was guilty of a, a real no-no, which was riding with his bike in a dangerous situation after I specifically told him, you must not ride your bicycle across such and such a street where there's through true traffic and big trucks. No, I went down, got down on my knees. We, uh, you understand? Yes, daddy. No bicycle? No, daddy. Where, where, where mustn't you ride your bicycle? Over there where the, all the traffic is. So you know now. Yes, I know, I know. Okay, good, 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 we're good. So I get home that night and Lee says, he's in his room. He went to the, you know, no fly zone. And so we sat in his room, reviewing the events and decided together what should be done. And I decided to use a little amateur psychology on him, first and last time. <laughs> I said to him, well, Paul, if you were me here and you were the dad, what would you do in this situation? And he answered, well, if I were you, I'd give me a second chance. <laughs> because early on he learned if you could make your dad laugh when he was mad at you, the game was over. The game was over. So this little boy understood something that I, in my anger and frustration and fear, right? And fear had completely forgotten. As far as I was concerned, there was only one course to follow, one option, punishment. I was just discussing with them, you know, what kind of punishment. But Paul reminded me at that very young age that there was another choice and one which was much more favorable to him, and that was forgiveness in the form of a second chance. This episode taught me not only something about being a dad, but it also serves as a constant reminder about the character of our Heavenly Father. When I read about God the Father's dealings with his children, I realize that he is the God of second chances. And so this morning, I'd like to share with you the stories of some people who benefited from a second chance that God gave them. Now in the Old Testament, there's no clearer example of a person receiving a second chance than David, the king of Israel. He began as a lowly shepherd and was given the opportunity and the strength to defeat Goliath, the enemy of his people. David received God's anointing as king and after many years of struggle was finally crowned after King Saul died. He consolidated military victories. He established a capital city in Jerusalem. He built a great palace and amassed a, a tremendous wealth and power and prestige. And then in 2 Samuel 11, we read of David's great sin with Bathsheba. I believe we're all very familiar with this story. At the time the armies were away fighting and David remained behind in Jerusalem and while in his palace saw a beautiful woman who was bathing. And he lusted after her and he seduced her even while knowing that she was one of his commander's wife. And she became pregnant because of their union. And so to hide his sin, he brought the husband Uriah home on leave hoping he'd sleep with his wife and thus cover the pregnancy. 
But the man Uriah was so loyal to his troops and to his king, he refused the comfort of his own home and his own bed and his own wife while his men were out in the field at war. And so his plan upset, David arranged to have the man deliberately killed in battle. After news of his death came, David took the woman Bathsheba to be his wife and he tried to hide the pregnancy in this way. In verse 27, the Bible records God's reaction to all of this. He said, but the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. Evil indeed, almost like an understatement. Look at what David had done. I'm going to ask you to turn this down just a little bit. This mic's a little too hot. Evil indeed. Look at what David had done. He had knowingly seduced another man's wife and committed adultery with her. He cheated on his own wives. I mean, you could take several wives, but you weren't allowed to take the wife of another man. He tried to pass his child off unto another man. Then he plotted the murder of a man who loved and served him, a man who was one of his 30 mighty men, who made up the king's elite corps of commanders and bodyguards. And then he deliberately lied to the nation in a cover-up. What he did should have been punished by, first of all, losing the crown. In other words, his family, his lineage, forfeit the crown and the throne forever. And then paying retribution to Uriah's family. And then death for himself and Bathsheba. But God sent the prophet Nathan to confront David concerning this evil and to describe the direct results due to his sins. And so Nathan said to David that he would have trouble in his own house and there would be violence in his own home because of what he had done. Because violence breeds violence. His wives would be taken away from him just like he took Uriah's wife. All this happening in the future. And because the child would be illegitimate, and the cause of blasphemy by others against the crown and the divinely appointed kings that wore it, God took the child at infancy. David responded to God by acknowledging his sins and regretting his actions. He also mourned deeply when the baby was born sick, asking God to spare his life. But the child died as God had said. But then we see how God of second chances dealt with this son of his who had acted in such a cowardly and shameful way. After the child died and the mourning was over, David was allowed to start all over again with Bathsheba. We read in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 24 and 25, it says, Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her, and she gave birth to a son, and he named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved him and sent word through Nathan the prophet and he named him Jedidiah for the Lord's sake. So he was allowed to take Bathsheba as his wife before God. This woman he had committed adultery with. They were able to have another child together and they called him Solomon which comes from the root word shalom mean, meaning peace. The name signified that they were at peace with God and with the birth of this child. And then the prophet Nathan, who had confronted David before with his sin, gave the child another inspired name. He called him Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord. And so David and Bathsheba were reassured that God loved their baby and would not take him away from them like he had done with the previous child. We also know that this child produced from this union would eventually become the third and most glorious king of Israel as well as an inspired writer. By rights, by law, this man David should have been stripped of the throne and executed. He should have never been allowed to marry this woman because he was the guilty party in the adultery. And yet, the God of second chances allowed him another opportunity to be king, to be husband, and to be father. Another example of this aspect of God's character is seen in John 
chapter eight, verse three. In John chapter eight, verse three, this is where Jesus comes face to face with a, a woman accused of um, adultery. And here John writes, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? So some people say that this was a trap and the woman who was having an affair was set up so she could be caught in the act with witnesses so there could be no doubt as to her guilt. The law, specifically Leviticus 20 verse 10, did specify that the punishment for this kind of offense was death by stoning. So let's keep reading. It says in verse six, they were saying this, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. So they were, you know, they were not interested in the woman. They were interested in finding some way to attack him. Now, if he said that they should go ahead and stone her, well, they would have accused him to the Roman governor as a lawbreaker because only the Roman officials could order an execution. On the other hand, if he opted for mercy, then they would have accused him of breaking the law of Moses, which said that such people should be punished. And so we read in verse seven. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Now the law said that those who had, uh, there had to be uh, two or three witnesses to prove the accusation and that if convicted, it was these witnesses who were to be the first ones to cast the stones. Jesus does not demand uh, an execution, nor does he plead for mercy. He merely asks them to compare themselves to this woman. To the eyewitnesses he said, if you are morally superior, you then have a right to do this. They couldn't legally do it without the permission of the Romans and they all knew this. Jesus simply asks them, aside from the legal right, which the law of Moses and the law of the Romans could provide, aside from this legal right, did anyone have the moral right to do this, especially when they may have been plotting against him in the first place? And so we read verse eight and nine again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. You know, his writing on the ground has been a mystery to many because the Bible doesn't say what he wrote on the ground. You know, some think it was to buy time. Others see this as God, you know, writing out their judgment, you know, the finger of God idea. I'll, lay, I'll wait till I get to heaven and I'll ask him about that that particular passage. The Bible says, however, that the witnesses and the crowd all left, beginning with the oldest to the youngest. Everyone was silent, including Jesus. No witnesses spoke, including the witnesses who had the right to accuse and punish, and that was the Lord Himself. And so in verse 10 and 11, we finish up and we read, straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Does no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. So her accusers are gone. The danger is past. She is left with the Lord alone. And Jesus, who knows the truth about her, he knows her life, he knows her secrets, he knows her failures. What does he do? Well, he gives her a second chance. That's what he does. This sin was known. This sin was an accident waiting to happen in her life. This sin came crashing down on her with all the humiliation and life destroying, ego crushing force that sin can have. Let's face it, think about it now. Imagine if you were dragged away from an adulterous affair and dragged into the middle of town and accused in front of everybody. Imagine how you would feel. Nothing to say, no defense. She was caught, she was going to pay. And what does God do? He saves her from the mob. He tells her that he too, for different reasons, does not condemn her. He tells her that she is free to go. He tells her, don't do this anymore. You see, the Pharisees and the religious leaders were there to see about punishment. How do we punish the guilty? Who punishes the guilty, how much punishment do the guilty receive? 
But Jesus opens up another option for the guilty, and that is forgiveness and the possibility of a second chance. You know, we may not have sinned as seriously as David with his adultery and his murder and his cover-up, and we may not have had to suffer public humiliation for our sins like this poor woman here in, in this story. But I ask every single one of you here this morning, who among us has not needed at one time or another a second chance from God? Anybody here never need a second chance from God? A second chance to do right by our parents. A second chance at marriage. A second chance after wasting our youth, our money, our talent, our promise, our opportunities, our health. Let's be thankful that God is a God of second chances because we all need a second chance at one time or another in our lives. Do you need a second chance from God today? You can receive another chance at a better eternal life, of course, by believing in His Son, Jesus Christ, and washing your sins away through repentance and baptism in His name. There's the second chance for non-believers. And when you become a Christian, the Bible says that you will be forgiven and have a second chance at everything. And if you are a Christian needing another chance, here's the really great news for you. God is not only the God of second chances, He's also the God of third chances and fourth chances and unlimited chances for His children who confess their faults and weaknesses and come to Him for help. The Lord Jesus Christ is waiting for you to ask Him for a second chance this morning. I encourage you, if you need that, don't leave here without asking and receiving that second chance. If you need to respond to this lesson, if you need that second chance in the waters of baptism or that second chance in confessing sin or that second chance in asking for help, our elders are here, they're present, they're ready, they're willing to pray for you and ask God to give you that second chance. Shall we stand and sing the song of encouragement while we consider our response? <laughs>